Good morning, everyone. Oh, the first half of the room's awake. Good morning, everyone. Fantastic, and uh, hello to everybody out there watching online. Great to have you with us. Uh, my name's Rob Sharp, and I'm the Senior Minister here at MAC, and it is good to be together. Uh, welcome if you're visiting with us today. We hope you'll get to know Christ better as we get to know you. A warm welcome to all of our regular members of our church family here at 9.30. It's good to be together, and uh, for those Joining us online, uh, we pray that you are doing okay, you're well, and that you'll be able to join us again soon. At Mac, we are alive with Christ, and so when we gather on Sundays, it's to know Christ more and more, or deeper and deeper as the roots go out. And this morning, uh, we're going to be doing that, uh, looking at Colossians uh, chapter 1. Uh, Phil Parker is our visiting preacher today. It's great to have Phil with us and back with us, uh, because as many of you know, he's served here uh, in the past, and uh, he's going to be talking about the basics have not changed. Uh, so that's really great to be hearing from Colossians chapter 1 there. Uh, as you might know, this last week has been NADOC week, uh, a time, a week to celebrate the history and culture of all Indigenous Australians. And so last week, we had our acknowledgement to country, and this week, I thought rather than just it being for one week, uh, that we would actually commit in prayer uh, Indigenous Australians to our great God for the weeks and years to come. And so I hope you'll join with me in uh, this prayer. I'm going to pray for Indigenous Australians. And at the end, I invite you to say a, an Amen with me. Let's pray. Creator God, you made from one man all nations and determined where each should live. We bring before you the Indigenous people of Australia. We acknowledge the history that has damaged the relationship between them and later arrivals to this land. Thank you for the steps that have been taken on the journey towards reconciliation. Deepen this process among us and through us. Guide national and community leaders to speak the truth in love, to seek justice with mercy and to care for those who are disadvantaged. Strengthen Indigenous church leaders to shepherd your flock faithfully and to strengthen all Indigenous Christians to be salt and light in their communities and in the whole nation. Give Indigenous and non-Indigenous believers grace to demonstrate the new family you are making in Christ out of people from every nation, tribe, language and people through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, as we gather in God's name and to meet with God this morning, uh, we have our first song. It's going to be our offertory song. Now, we can't sing uh, out loud, but we can sing with our souls. And so uh, we're going to sing the song, The Love of the Father. And so I invite you, you can stay seated, uh, just to use this time to reflect and to prepare our hearts and minds as we meet with God. Uh, did the offer tree go round? Great. It's always hard when you're at the front. I'm going to give thanks to God for that. Heavenly Father, we invest these treasures in heaven where they will not rust or decay or be stolen. For you are the treasure of our heart. Use our giving to grow your kingdom through our gospel partnership and for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Time for some church news. Uh, as always, encourage you to check out the Mac update. Uh, it's a great way to know what's going on in the broader life of Mac. But I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. Firstly, the Wiley Park Barbecue. Our partnership with the cross-cultural worker Margaret out in Western Sydney, uh, they host, or they're hoping to host, uh, a community barbecue, which is something that they had previously done and are wanting to start up. Now, of course, COVID may well have a, a sort of changed plans, and we will need to be flexible with that. But as I said last week, if we're not planning for it, then we'll be caught out. So the hope is that we'll be able to send a carload of people to help serve and sort out the food and cook it and then serve it. But also uh, that we as a church will be able to fund the food on that particular barbecue. And like I said last week, we'll do that a couple of times a year. And so if you're able and willing to make a donation towards the cost of the barbecue, we're seeking 
to raise uh, around $250. Uh, there's envelopes on the welcome bench out there in the foyer and you can just grab one of those and uh, you can either give it to uh, one of our wardens or put it into the connect box that's just right there and we'll be able to get uh, make sure that's put somewhere secure after the service. And the second thing is to do with the Mac prayer network. And so you read about that on the front of the Mac update. I really want to encourage you to be thinking about whether you are open to receiving uh, prayers through that email and committing to praying for them. But also want to let you or be make sure you're aware that that's an avenue to request prayers. And even through if email, asking for prayer through the email doesn't work for you, there is the connect cards uh, that you can write a prayer request there as well. Uh, the other thing uh, is that the Mac new Mac directories have uh, been printed, which is great. And they're out in the foyer on the table there. Uh, for those who are in the directory, uh, you have one that has your name on it. So please make sure you only take the one that's got your name on that. It's on the front on a sticker. And uh, big thanks to Kathy uh, for doing all the work to put that together and also for James for taking the photos for us. And finally, the connect cards. Uh, we want to connect with you, uh, particularly if you're new, we want to be able to connect with you as you're a visitor, but also with our regular members. We'd love to keep connecting with you as a church. And so please use those connect cards that are out in the foyer there. Uh, you can put questions, comments, or prayer requests. Uh, and if you're online, uh, then just email the office or info and uh, we'd love to be able to connect with you in that way too. We uh, have two special guests here with us today. As I said, Phil Parker's here to preach, but also Murray, our student at Moore College, is going to be coming up in a moment to share with us about, particularly about Moore College mission. Um, but also I wanted to share with you uh, that we have much to give thanks and praise to God for because Murray let me know a little bit ago uh, that he's got his results from semester one and he well and truly passed every uh, all of his subjects. And so we can give thanks to God for that. It is a great answer to prayer and uh, great work, mate. All right, come on up and share with us about college mission. Yeah, g'day everybody. Uh, thanks for your prayers for uh, more College Mission back in March. You'll remember that we were talking about it and for your prayers with my studies. So many funny stories and so many examples of where God was in our lives for that eight days that we were there and I can't go into them all with the time but I'll quickly skim through what I can. So uh, around about March every year a chaplaincy group from Moore College will go to various churches all over um, New South Wales, sometimes in the state. So there's about 18 of us from the different four years. And uh, there's two chaplains go with us, a female and a male, who was Simon and Sarah for us. We went to South Liverpool Anglican, which is around about Kasula, the crossroads way, if you know around there. Uh, very lower socioeconomic area, one of the most cultural, multicultural places in Australia. A um, lot of different religions, a uh, bit of government housing there, um, quite different to perhaps the Southern Highlands area. Okay, so this was our first Sunday and um, Michael's a fourth year doing the sermon. Uh, this lady was a Fijian Indian coming to church. We were told to sit beside someone at the church services that we didn't know and we didn't know anyone, of course. Um, so there's Michael with his wife and I just thought I'd throw in a picture of their baby they've just had a couple of weeks ago. That's little Amelia. Okay, so on Monday morning we had a lecture about the um, Mandaean religion, which you may or may not have heard of. There's only about 50 or 60,000 of them left in the world. There's 10,000 right here in Australia. That's one of their temples. They've got one in Liverpool. That's the Liverpool one and the, the Dharma is the emblem up above. Uh, George Harvey did the lecture with his wife Sandy. They're from Iraq. Um, with that religion... They don't believe in Jesus. They believe in God. They have a form of a Holy Spirit. They do believe in John the Baptist. And uh, they became Baptists. They emigrated to Australia in 1980 and they became Baptists. And uh, when they became Baptists, the religion just wiped them. They wouldn't even acknowledge them if they met them in the street or anything. Uh, the other thing is it's a dying religion because the young ones don't want to do it. 
Okay, we got a lot of instruction to do evangelizing. So there's a lot of door knocking, a lot of short shopping center evangelism. That's our male chaplain, obviously. Simon is the deputy principal. So uh, we were doing stuff like uh, two ways to live, the three circles. If you don't know the three circles, look it up on YouTube. It's much simpler than two ways to live and it does the same thing. Uh, storyboarding, where you can draw pictures of the gospel quickly with people that are not Christians. And another thing they taught us was when you're telling a story out of the gospel, to tell it very simply. So as I was joking about all the long names in Nehemiah a couple of weeks ago, you, you limit yourself to three complicated names, no more than three, and you don't call something a sycamore fig tree, you just call it a tree, you keep it really simple, and that's another thing that they taught us. Um, so the door knocking went really, really well. We did three days of door knocking, we did it in pairs. Um, oh, this is one of our, this is one of the younger students, that's Tom, he's 21, and I'm the oldest, I'm 59, okay? <laughs> I got that picture because you can see the crown on the picture on Tom's head there, I thought that might have been a sign. Okay, Bible study, every night we did something. We did eight days and we were exhausted by the end of it. We either went to dinner with members of the congregation, so we had Indian food, Pakistani food. We were told to eat everything on our plate and ask for more, which is a big call. Um, it is. Um, so that's the first year there, Sam, doing an Indian Bible study. Uh, another thing we did of a night time was obviously youth group. Okay, this is when the church van came. Right, in the middle we had a social day, so you could either go to the Blue Mountains with the female chaplain or you could go out on the harbour with uh, Simon, so that were the choices. I didn't go to either because Helen and I were helping out children problems that our eldest daughter had issues, so we were doing that that day, but looks like they had a good time. Okay, shopping centre evangelism, two days of that, one day we had to talk to people in the shopping centre. We got a couple of brush offs there, I've got to honestly say nobody was rude at any stage, it blew me away, I didn't know what to expect. A lot of people were open. Um, and then another day in the shopping centres, we had to try and talk to the shop assistants when they, weren't, when they weren't dealing with staff. With the door knocking, we had two approaches. The first approach was to say we were from the local Anglican church and could we pray for something about you that's good or bad in your life? If that didn't work, we then said to them, we're trying to get to know people in the community. Can you tell us a bit about your life story? And it's surprising how many people opened up, invited us into their houses sometimes. It went really well. This is one of the evening dinners. That's at a Pakistani meal. Um, we had a, we did a lot of walking around Liverpool Shopping Centre and there's a lot of soothsayers and palm readers. It's so multicultural. Some pretty weird sort of establishments there, all sorts of spirituality going on. Um, these are mandanes, these men that are retired and sitting in the mall playing chess. That's one of our students, Joss. He's a first year. They asked him to have a game of chess with him he said no no I haven't got time I'm door knocking they said it won't take long and they clean him up in about four or five minutes flat laser tag for the youth group they turn the hall into a bit of a commando scene dim the lights lots of blankets lots of furniture and that's our deputy getting right into it okay we got a guided tour of the mosque at Hoxton Park you can see it just near the M7 freeway if you're driving through the sheiks in the middle the ladies all had to wear scarves, all of our girls. And by the way, we weren't allowed to wear shorts or, or dresses at all. Not that I wear a dress much. But everyone had to cover their legs the whole week of mission there due to the various sensitivities. Okay, Brooke, second year. She's doing a youth group thing on the second Sunday service. This is all about the bit in Mark where Jesus has the, the double healing of the blind man. So she drew a picture of a landscape with black paint. Birds, trees, hills, sun, all black, 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 ended up with a black picture. And then one that she prepared earlier, as we say, she did this picture of Jesus earlier in the week on her own and she turned the page over and she said, so people who don't want to see Jesus see the black and then she turned the page over and she said, but this is what you can see if you're willing to see and that was the children's lecture. We didn't know where she was going with it. It was terrific and, of course, it has connotations with Peter not understanding what... Uh, Jesus was talking about in chapter 8 in Mark as well when he said he was going to get resurrected. Okay, last day. Our poor our fourth year that was going to do the sermon, which was a sermon about the crucifixion and the Romans saying, this truly is the Son of God. He got sick overnight, so Simon stepped in our deputy and did a terrific job of it, and there's some of our other students all contributing. And the last thing that I did was I went to a house Pakistani church service on the Sunday afternoon after the morning service. So over the back of the top right-hand photo is Adam. He's a third year. He did the sermon all about the little, the little children coming to Jesus and Jesus wanting them to come. Um, that's the minister in the middle. 
Uh, it's in someone's lounge room, and that's me down the bottom doing my testimonial about why I'm going to Moore College and how I want to do work for Transport for Christ. And that's our final, final day. That's all of us that were there. Um, the ministers, the senior minister was Manoj Chaco, and the assistant minister was Matthew Bales. And there's a cake that my wife Helen cooked for the final day. So thanks for your time. If you've got any questions, come and ask me any time in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for that week of mission and uh, thank you for the way that through that time you equipped and encouraged those students in that chaplaincy group and, and through all the groups on mission. And we do pray for that church, uh, Liverpool South, and, and for the ongoing desire to share Christ and connect with their community. Uh, we thank you for the support and encouragement that that mission would have been to them. And Father, we do give you praise and thanks uh, for the way that you've been at work in and through Murray this year with his studies at first year at college, uh, through the, the challenges you've sustained him and the ups and downs, you've been his rock. And we pray that as he heads into semester two next week, we commit him to you and pray that you would continue to grow his knowledge and his understanding and his faith in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. We've um, come to a time of confession now. God calls us to live our lives for his glory. And Jesus said, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul and with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. But we fail to honour God as we should and to respond to his love for us as is right. And so recognising our guilt and trusting in God's mercy and grace, let us confess our sins to God together. Uh, let us pray this prayer of confession out loud together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought, nor loving our neighbour as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbour and to live for your honour and glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's hear these words of assurance of our forgiveness through Christ from Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him and in whose spirit is no deceit. Let's pray. Merciful Father, we rejoice that you pardon and forgive those who truly repent and trust in your Son. Deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to have our Bible readings now. Uh, so if uh, Andrew and Jenny want to come on up. Good morning. The first Bible reading is Psalm 98. You'll find it on the back of your pink handout if you'd like to follow along. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth, burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. 
He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. And our second reading can be found on the front of the pink sheet. Colossians 1, 1 to 14, 21 to 23. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. To God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that springs from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. It's the end of the reading. Well, good morning, 9.30 Church. Can I just ask, can you just wave wave a hand around if uh, I was here, if you were here with me two years ago uh, when I was here last week, like, okay, a lot of of good friends out here. Um, After the appointment to one of my earlier parishes, a lady came up to me at the door after the first service and said, we're here to check you out. Now, you might be new, uh, to me, and we mightn't uh, have met because you might have been here new in the last two years. You might be in online service. Welcome to you today as well. And if I haven't met you yet, uh, my name's Phil Parker and I'm glad to be here. But you may be one of the old hands uh, who's been here for a while. And uh, if that's the case, it's really good to be able to have this reunion with you. And I've got to say that I am enthusiastic and keen to be back here at St. Stephen's today. 
Rob Sharp, thank you for the invitation and honor to be able to come back here. It's been two years, almost to this exact same day in July, since uh, I finished uh, that locum covering for Matthew Brooks Lloyd, uh, while um, Richard Mills was the rector here. He's now gone to Denham Court, as you'll know, and you've had Michael Blake as your assistant minister until the time when Rob was appointed as the new uh, rector here and uh, bring in what looks to me like something that's going to be a, a breath of change, a breath of uh, new breeze uh, coming on through under Rob Sharp's direction. Now, friends, wasn't that Psalm uh, 98 a wonderful Psalm? Declaring our praises to God who is faithful to us and in a world of change as it was back there for the psalmist and it is for us now, still recognising that the same God is there, he has not changed and his faithfulness remains and that's why the psalmist in that Old Testament reading was full of praise and adoration for that God. I just found that very uh, encouraging to hear that Old Testament reading but that's not our text today. Our text today is going to be our New Testament text which is going to come from Colossians chapter 1. Now brothers and sisters, two years since we've met but in that time the Lord God Almighty has expected us to grow since we last met together. Have you? Have we? Have we grown since that time? I remember um, one of our past great bishops who was a good friend, uh, Reg Piper. Uh, Reg Piper, uh, whenever he was speaking in uh, later days, used to always remind the congregations, have you read your Bible? Have you been saying your prayers? Well, we're meant to have grown in the last two years and like Reg, I would say, do you know your Bible now better than you did July in 2019? Have you devoted your life to the Lord on a regular devotional daily basis? Have you been having your quiet time regularly, day by day, so that you get refreshed in spirit to come before the Lord and be refreshed to live the life that you need to live within your world, your family, your community? Have you been regular in church? From the hands waving earlier on, I can see that, yes, Many of us have been regular here at the 9.30 service and it's a joy and a glory to be able to meet with you again, even though after two years it's going to be a challenge to remember all the names, although it was, was good to get a couple of people before the service and I was able to remember a couple of people's names, that's good. But if you've been regular in church, if you've come from another church and are new to this parish over the last two years, have you been coming along to this church regularly now and did you go to your previous church as a Christian person? The Lord would expect that you did. Have you been, as Reg Piper reminded us, saying your prayers? Maybe you've even been down literally on your knees in the privacy of your own room and humbly bowed before the Lord and said your prayers on a regular basis. And have you been outworking your Christian life by loving your community in the way that Jesus commanded us with the great command to love your neighbour as yourself? Have we been doing all of those things? And as I ask you, I have to ask myself exactly the same questions and be challenged about whether I'm growing in my Christian life. Well, we come to this point now where we are reunited and... It's a new vision and a new mission brewing at St Stephen's, so I hear. I received a copy of your preliminary vision thoughts sheet. Looks pretty exciting. I've read written words that say there's a desire to move forward in gospel ministry. Is that your desire as part of the corporate body? To move forward in gospel ministry from this point? It's been a bit of a sort of a fragmented two years, I understand. I've prayed for you folk monthly since we last met at this time because I pray through the Wollongong region, uh, Anglican Church Regional Prayer Diary and Mittagong comes up once a month. And in general, I'm sure I've missed a few here and there, but in general I've prayed for Mittagong 
And uh, that's been easy for me to do because I feel this personal close connection with you. And I'll keep praying for you while ever the Bishop's Office keeps putting out the regional diary. And uh, that's a good thing. <clears throat> so I want to share with you today two reminders. Sorry, I want to share with you today one reminder. Next week's going to be another one. It's a little mini series of two while I'm with you. So here this week and here next week. Two reminders, one on each week. The first reminder, as Rob already hinted to, is that the basics have not changed. Time moves on, but the basics in the Christian life have not changed. That's today. The second reminder, next week, if you are inspired and come back to church and get back online again, hopefully we'll be able to meet again in church pretty soon, but it's looking a bit bleak at the moment, isn't it? You realise that we've got a privilege here that six million people in Sydney, Greater Sydney, can't do because we're out here in Southern Highlands. We are able to meet like this, masks and all, but our friends in Sydney, our Christian friends and brothers and sisters, six million Sydney people who are not able to come into church like this, we should count this a privilege and count our blessings today. And the young people, it is so good to see children in our congregation here. Maybe there's some children in our online services watching on as well. I want to include you today as well. And so I'm going to try and keep it simple. I need to do that because... Don't know about you, but I find reading Paul's letters pretty hard work. Not because there's anything wrong with them, but because Paul packs so much into what he says and often his sentences are so long, it's very hard. We're going to un unpack some of that today. And kids, if you've got your pink Bible sheet with you or if you've got a real Bible, it's going to be really handy to follow on with that as well. I'll try and keep you in the loop as we go. So let's move on. Our subject today is Christian basics. So if you've got a pen and you're writing on that pink sheet where there's room to write in your sermon notes so you can think, oh, what did that guy preach on uh, this week? And you go back and you look back at it. Oh, that's right. And you can remember it. The topic today is Christian basics. The basics have not changed. That's the title of the sermon. And it leads us to consider a significant question. Now, I am a returning pastor to this church after two years and I have got a pastoral heart to be able to share with you what can I, a returning St Stephen's pastor with this pastoral heart for a church which is being revisited, what can I remind you of in this very small 20-minute window of opportunity in this sermon? Well, the answer is St Stephen's is at a time of change at the moment. Even as an outsider, I recognise that. And you're in the thick of it at the moment and Rob's got to lead that. You know, pray for the Lord for giving him guidance and discernment. We're at a time of change. However, our first reminder is that the basics have not changed. The basics have not changed. And so I'd like us to go to the Colossians text, Colossians chapter 1. If you've got your Bible or your pink sheet, it'll be very handy for you to have that in front of you. You can divide this chapter, and boys and girls, if you saw this, there's just two big thoughts in it. In, in my opinion, two great big thoughts. The first big thought goes from verse 3 to verse 12 and it's the way that the Apostle Paul, who's writing this letter from prison to a group of people in a church that he's never met, Paul's in Rome, the Colossians are way over there in Turkey on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea. Paul has only heard about this church but he's writing them a pastoral letter. And he wants them to know that he's praying for them, even though he's never met them. The second thing, or the second big section of this chapter, is I think from verse 13 down to, uh, to verse 23. And it's Paul's big statement of what it actually is to be Christian and to be included within the Christian church. What it is to be Christian and what it is to be included in the Christian church. So with those two big thoughts in mind, let's tackle the text itself and go to the first movement, the way Paul prays for his remote Christian family at Colossae. And this should be the way that I'd be praying for you as well. So as we're thinking about Paul and the Colossians, let's think about your pastors and your church here as well and about people that you've got responsibility to pray for if you're a Christian elder and everyone here is a Christian elder if they're more mature than someone else. 
Because if you're more mature, that means that you're older in the Lord. And so you've got an opportunity to pray as well. Let's look at Paul's prayer. There's a couple of things he does from verse 3 to 8, and I'm going to open my Bible. It's a prayer of thankfulness. Paul is excited to thank God as he thinks about this group of Christians for these three things. Paul thanks God for the faith that he's heard about within the church. The Colossian church had dependence on Jesus. Paul heard about it and he said to God, thank you, Lord, that that church depends on the Lord Jesus Christ. I question myself here. Does St Stephen's 9.30 Sunday congregation depend on the Lord Jesus Christ do you have a living faith? That's what faith means. It means depending. If you've got faith in something, it means you depend in it. If you've got faith in money, you depend in it. If you've got faith in Jesus, you depend on him. The faith in the money won't last for all that long. Faith in Jesus will, because that's one thing that does not change. What the money can do does change. And one day it'll be burnt up and it'll be all gone. But Jesus won't. Paul also prays um, in thankfulness to God for the love that he's heard about in the church. Does this church congregation exhibit love within the body? I wouldn't be surprised if it does. And what about the 8 o'clock congregation? What about the 5 o'clock congregation? What about the 11 o'clock congregation? And what about the faithful brothers and sisters at my church just across the road in St Jude's in Barrel. That's where I go now. They're your brothers and sisters. Do you love them even though you may not have met them because they are part of the Christian church? Well, Paul was thankful to God because the Colossians did. And thirdly, he's thankful to God because this church carries an eternal hope. This church, he's heard, knows where they're going. Now, they're having some hard times in Colossae within the Roman Empire. Tough days. We're having some hard times. Tough days. It's always tough days in some ways. Before COVID, there was still plenty of tough around. Now, you young guys, you're coming up through school. You might be having to be homeschooled at the moment. Think this is tough. Mum and Dad got to show me through the lessons and all that sort of stuff. It's always been tough times, but... We Christian people know that these times are going to come to a final end and conclusion because the Lord is in control and just like the Colossians, we have got a hope of our final destination. We know that we're going to heaven in the end and we also know that our experience in the world now, even with the tough times, has got parts of heavenliness in it as well. So Paul is thankful for those things. Verses 9 to 12, Paul's prayer then moves across from thankfulness to asking God for something. Let's have a look at verse 9. Paul says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, Colossians, we've not stopped praying for you and asking God. And then he goes on, and I'm going to make it a bit easier for you, by saying he asks God that they, the, the Christian people will be filled with, with a knowledge of what God wants them to do. The will of God. Lord, would you give this congregation a knowledge of where you're going so that they can lock in with that and they can go with you. Lord, 9.30 at St Stephen's, would you please give them a knowledge of where you are going so that this congregation can lock in with where you're going and your pastors can go on that journey with you. If you keep reading through the passage, he mentions the spiritual wisdom that's involved in finding out God's will. He mentions the spiritual understanding that's involved in comprehending the will of God. And so he makes request to God that God will lead the church in this way. Now, why is Paul asking God these favours to help this church of people he's never met before to help them out? It's because he wants his church to live a life which is worthy 
of honouring and pleasing God himself. Isn't that the aim of our church here on earth? Is that our church, in amongst all the darkness, and I, I put it to you, the darkness is darkening and getting darker as our culture changes and we leave our Christian roots behind us and go into a whole new world, which I don't need to go explaining now. All you need to do is look at the sorts of things that you see on the news and the way that the news is now portrayed, not so much as news, but as commentary and as opinion and as indoctrination about the way you should think. It's a world going away from God, who is the light, got to be moving into shades of darkness. So in this sort of world, Paul wants the Colossians and your pastors want you to live lives in amongst this which is actually pleasing to God. It'll cause you to shine like a light and radiate like a beacon out into your community and self-support one another within your church community. He wants lives that are full of good works. He wants lives that are learning to know God more and more day by day. He wants lives that are full of godly power in a powerless world. And he wants lives giving thanks to God, just like Paul was giving thanks to God the Father, for bringing the church more and more out of darkness into this greater and greater light. It's all polarising, isn't it? The light's getting lighter and the dark is getting darker. We may see more of that as the current years go on. Tell me, is this the pattern of church life here at St Stephen's at the present time? It should be because, as we've said, the basics have not changed. The basics have not changed. Well, the second movement um, is Paul's statement to the church about what it actually is to be Christian and to be included within the Christian church. And very simply, we pick up at verse 13. And I'll go to it. He says, because God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and he's brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Well, that's what I've just been explaining before. Um, uh, rescued us from darkness, taking us into the kingdom of light. So what it is to be Christian is to be rescued. You have been rescued. Individually, you've been rescued and corporately you've been rescued. And this parish church has been rescued by God, rescued from being immersed and covered up by the darkness, which is creeping over like the storm clouds, and rescued to be put into, out of the darkness and into the kingdom of God, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Down to verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. We've got here a reminder of what we Christians have come from, before we were Christians, we were separated from God. Once again, talking to the younger people and the children, guys, have you actually come to the place where you've actually committed your, yourself to God, not following your parents' lead in their Christianity, but taking up Christianity for yourself? Have you come to that place? Have you actually become a Christian yourself? There's things for us to be able to talk about. The Bible says that once upon a time we were all separated from God. We were enemies in our minds and we had evil behaviour. Some of us might know what that's like. But we've been also reminded of what we Christians not only just come from, but where we're going to, what we've come to. And the Bible tells us that we're coming to a place of being reconciled with God. That means the books have been rebalanced. Verse 22, Paul says, but now... God has, rec has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death into presenting you holy in his sight. So can you see what's going on here? Paul tells us that the tables have been turned. The books have been rebalanced. Once upon a time, we were living in darkness and death because of our sin and Jesus was in heaven with God the Father in absolute light and holiness. But the reconciling meant that when Jesus came from heaven, that's Christmas, Jesus born, and went to the cross, that's Easter, Jesus died. 
holy Jesus took on the darkness of humanity so that humanity, which was in darkness and sin and blackness, could be washed clean of that and be given the holiness of Jesus and Christ. That, well, that's what it is to become a Christian. That's why Murray's telling us about the religious group there in South Liverpool. They believe in God. They don't believe in Jesus. That's the way the problem is. The devil believes in God. Believing in God's not the, not, not the thing. You've got, it's got to be more than that. There's got to be a reconciliation. There's got to be a reconciling done. God's got to be able to take your darkness and give you his light. That's what it is to become a Christian and that's what those folk in Liverpool, they need to get through that boundary, through that barrier and be able to see that. There's one little caution in verse 23. Will you look at that with me? Verse 23, he says, Hey guys, watch out. It's all well and good to be Christian and whatnot, but you know what? Verse 23, it's only if, if you continue in your faith to the end. You've got to not just be living Christian life now, that's the way you've got to die. You've got to see the race all the way to the end. Well, we need to wrap up. It's time to conclude. And so I'd like to conclude this very concentrated passage that Paul writes in his letters to the Colossians with three points of application. What do we get out of this passage? Firstly, I think we get out of it pretty clearly that the Christian church is a single family. We are, in fact, the family of God. I think that was one of the songs. It was, I think it was the first song that might have been up there with the guys singing, if I got the right service. So it's important for us to know we are, we're unified. We're together. We're all on the same team and we should love one another and support one another. That's the first point of application here, just like the Colossians should. Number two. Just like Paul was thankful, we need to thank God for one another and thank God for this Christian family, this family of light. And we need to ask God to bless this family and to cultivate it and to fertilise it and nourish it, just like Paul wanted to happen to the Colossian church. That's the second point. Thank God and ask God's blessing on this church that we might know God's will, that St Stephen's might know God's will for this next, uh, pardon me, for this next phase of ministry. And the third point, within this congregation of people, some of us, there's a few of us being called out, maybe Murray might be one of these as he's exploring, going to more college and exploring where the Lord's taking him. He might be called out to be like an apostle, a special minister who's got a special oversight within the church. For him, it might be the church of the truck drivers. All right? For you... It might be another special calling. For Rob, it's clearly a calling. He's been ordained to it. That's why he's got the title Reverend and you should respect that. Recognised by the Anglican Church in Sydney. But even if you don't have a special calling like that, just being a Christian means that all of us who actually are Christians, we need to be living as Christians. We need to be Christians continuing in our faith or our dependence until the end of the race. And we need to be continuing in faith in Jesus. Well, they're the three big things which I think come out of this passage, which are basically, using the word twice, they are the Christian basics, aren't they? And the basics have not changed. That's what I want to remind you and encourage you with this week, that the basics have not changed as you move in the new territory. Will you pray with me? as I pray about these particular issues. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we do give thankfulness for the faithfulness of the Colossian church and also for the faithfulness of many of the churches who are around us in Sydney and uh, New South Wales, Australia, the true Christian churches who follow the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. We uh, give you um, thankfulness for our brothers and sisters. We thank you for the appointment of the Reverend Rob Sharp to Mittagong and for a new vision and a mission which is brewing here at this church. We pray that the 930 congregation will find their place within that new plan. Lord, in new days for St Stephen's, we pray that you would grant us 
to be able to rest and depend firmly in the unchanging Christian basics. Help us to rest in our faith in Jesus. Give us love within this church and its four congregations. Give us hope of heaven with our open ears that we might have to the gospel. And we pray also, Lord, that you would make this church a Christian witness to a world which is in crisis and a world which is uh, uh, present in this place in these darkening days. We know you can do it, Lord, because we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all God's people said... In response to God's word to us this morning, we have a very special opportunity to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And so we can begin preparing our hearts uh, to join in that meal. At the heart of the Christian life is an active trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as our saviour and our trust in his sacrificial death for sin. In this symbolic meal, originating from Jesus' last supper with his disciples, We're going to express and strengthen our faith in him as we eat and drink with our brothers and sisters in Christ together. The Lord's Supper, it's an outward and a visible sign of the grace shown to us by God in the Lord Jesus Christ. As we share the bread and drink the juice together, we're invited to feed on Christ in our hearts. It's not a physical thing, it's it's a spiritual thing of feeding in our hearts by faith, with thanksgiving. May our souls be fed today. We're faced again with God's love for us who are unworthy and we're reminded and strengthened uh, in his grace. And our our faith is strengthened in, in the one whose body was given and whose blood was shed for us, Jesus. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth, And he wrote to them about the need to examine ourselves uh, before we join in the meal. What he's talking about there is to to consider where is our relationship with God? Are there areas of our life that we have held back from God? And if so, we need to examine ourselves before we join in the meal that proclaims, no, no, we have fellowship with him and we're united with him and, and dedicated to him. But it's also... As Paul talks about the body, he means the Christian body. And so we need to examine or consider, are we out of relationship with other Christians? And for our part, have we sought to be reconciled with them? We need to do that work before we join in the meal, Paul says. We read, whenever you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then eat the bread and drink from the cup. And so if in good conscience it would not be right for you to participate in the meal, then I urge you, please use this time uh, to come before God and, and speak to him about either repenting before him and being reconciled with others and reflect on the love of God in Christ Jesus for you. Well, let's come with heartfelt repentance and genuine trust in the Lord Jesus, recognising the significance of sharing in this way. We have this prayer of preparation that I invite you to say out loud with me today if you're going to join in the meal. We do not presume... Do you have that? No, you don't. There you go. How about I pray? We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your boundless goodness and mercy. We're not even worthy to eat the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, always rich in mercy. Enable us by faith to eat the flesh of your dear son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may be cleansed from sin and forever dwell in him and he in us. Amen. 
in the accounts of Jesus' life. We read that on the night before he died, Jesus took bread and when he'd given God thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and he said this, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And after the meal, he took the cup and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we join in this meal together by both Jesus' invitation, but he's also his call to remember. I'll lead us in prayer. Father, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine and pray that we who eat and drink them in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, believing our Saviour's word, may be partakers of his body and blood. To Jesus Christ who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. In a moment, the elements are going to get distributed. But I want to encourage us this morning to have uh, three things on our mind, let's call it. Three Fs. The three Fs of the Lord's Supper. The first one is forgiveness. This is a time for sorrow because, as the hymn says, it was my sins that held him there. But it's also a time of joy because we understand that the judgment has been paid, that we are forgiven. So the first F is forgiveness. The second is fellowship. Jesus is with us right here, right now. And we are united in him together. We are the body of Christ. We are this new family. And so we have forgiveness, but we also have fellowship. And the third F is remember the feast. Now we feed by faith. And yes, you're not going to be feasting on a small little piece of bread and, and a little cup of juice. But Jesus, feasting on all that he has done for us and all that he is, that is our feast today. But also it reminds us of the feast to come when we will be at the king's table celebrating for eternity in heaven. We have forgiveness, we have fellowship, and we have feasting. And I invite you to reflect on those things as we join in this meal together. So if we can have the elements distributed, uh, please hold on to them um, and uh, we'll join in the meal together.
with the bread. Take and eat this in remembrance of Christ's body was broken for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. And with a cup, drink this in remembrance of Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, in your loving kindness, accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by the merits and death of your son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. With gratitude for all your mercies, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work for your praise and glory. Amen. Uh, our Second song for today is Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. Um, it's a favourite of mine and I hope it's a great encouragement to you as we reflect on those words in our souls. The formal part of our gathering, uh, let me lead us in prayer uh, through Paul's prayer for the Colossians. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would spill us by your spirit, uh, with the knowledge of your will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding, in order that we, your people, would live a life worthy of you and pleasing to you. That we would be growing in our knowledge of you more and more. That we would bear fruit in every good work that by your mighty strength and power we would have endurance and patience. And finally, with joy, we would give thanks for the inheritance that we share with all your people, the inheritance of joining with you in heaven. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our formal time is over, but we do have uh, continued fellowship over our morning tea. And so encourage you to head out to the hall. I think we're serving from there. Is that right? Is anybody on morning tea or have they already gone? They're probably gone to get ready. Uh, look, let's head out up there and try and see what's going on. But uh, I encourage you to continue to uh, care for one another. Keep our distance. Uh, if we're eating we don't or drinking, we don't need a mask. But otherwise, let's keep masking up. Um, and uh, yeah, let's go and have fellowship together. We're in the foyer. All right. So what that means is we can't be mingling around out there. Try and grab a seat and sit down once you've got your morning tea or it's served to you. Thanks very much.